All right, you wanted winemakers? We're bringing you winemakers. We have an amazing winemaker today by the name of Adam Wadowitz. He is the winemaker extraordinaire behind the eponymous Shoran Smith label and also happens to be co-CEO as well. If you're unfamiliar with Shoran Smith, there are very few wineries in Australia that really would take the pursuit of excellence into the core of its DNA as much as this particular winery. We're talking two MWs at the helm, amazing winemaking pedigree, uh, and a winemaker, Adam, who is uh, coming from amazing stock. Uh, McLaren Vale born boy, ended up winning the Jimmy Watson trophy, a very lauded trophy in the Australian winemaking scene. When working at Best Great Western, his, I believe it was his first year as well. And of all those years being 2011, probably one of the hardest years to make wine in Australia, with some notable exceptions. Love you, Margaret River. He moved from there, ended up at Shaw and Smith, and it's just been winner after winner after winner. Shaw and Smith has always been making incredible wines, but his ability to be able to read the market and read the vineyard and really understand what excellence looks like from both a viticultural perspective as well as a winemaking perspective is next level. And the most fascinating thing for me is this guy is not this hyper technically minded super nerdy engineer type he's just a guy a really lovely guy to sit down i couldn't have a chat with adam over anything honestly the cricket coffee freaking any kind of farming let alone viticulture anyway today you're going to be able to get a bit of an insight into how adam makes the decisions that he makes how the inner workings of you know shaw and smith operates and how a winery from the adelaide hills seemingly has ended up in tasmania Anyway, enjoy the chat. Thanks so much for being here. Happy Obviously, very awesome. frosty morning as well, 9 a.m. start. Freezing. <laughs> yeah. Freezing. Uh, literally, ABC was saying this morning it was the coldest September day in 100 years in South Australia. I'd believe that in a heartbeat. Yeah. yeah. I'd believe that Chilly in a heartbeat. This we have this gym next door to our place that we've sort of ramshackled farmhouse gym. Went yep. down and grabbed the barbell and I'm peeling my hands off it. And I'm like, this morning's just not the morning for it. <laughs> I think this is going to be a rest day. Um, well, tell us, Adam, uh, Vintage 2024, how'd it go? Yeah, it was, it was a challenge. Uh, we sort of, you know, we come off the back of those three La Nina years, so, mm -hmm. which are all you know, influenced by that heavy rainfall. And then we were sort of all sick of cold, wet years. So uh, I think for <laughs> us, you know, we were just happy to look forward, you know, towards something a bit warmer and a bit more, you know, on the other end of the spectrum. But mm. we didn't really get that. You know, we sort of had the rainfall all through mm. all through winter and uh, and then poor flowering during that time, which is, you know, when you get those wet, cold springs. And, and then it didn't really get warm until until – Christmas, you know. So yeah. I mean, Christmas we 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 got a pool, so you notice it whether you're in there or not, and it was freezing, so it didn't warm up until January, and then after January it did get warm, and then mm. yeah, so we had really healthy vines, um, really small yields, but uh, a warm finish, and so the wines are uh, they have a yeah they're they're nice, they've got a, a a good amount of intensity, but yeah, there's certainly not much of them, particularly from mm. the hills, yeah, so. We didn't really know like what was going on with the season last year, did we? Like, <laughs> no, I definitely did not. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I had no clue what was going on vintage last year. We actually have like so we we do up these t-shirts every year yeah. that uh, have like a little grape caricature, and they're doing something that's related to the vintage of the time. Yeah. And so like two years ago, when it was an exceptionally wet year, it was La Nina Extrema, and the dudes like riding like a barrel down like the right Riverland, away, and it's yeah. like past like <laughs> the Wakery sign, the Renmark sign. It's like it's fucking so wet. And this one we had was a really good one. It was El Nino Kino because everyone was betting that it was going to be El Nino. Yeah. And it kind of never fucking came. Exactly. And yeah. now it, it came actually during winter. Yeah. Didn't it? We've yeah. had the most amazing dry winter and then early spring. Mm. Um, almost four weeks early. Are you worried about what's going on in the vines at the moment, or uh, I'm pretty pretty relaxed. I, I just got back from Margaret River, and those those they had similar but worse in terms of rainfall. You know, we've been mm. missed out on rain from January through to sort of you know oh, June. Um, but those guys, those vines didn't go to sleep, so mm. that's a very strange occurrence. They had you know, so they were trying to struggle with vines that were growing that you know that long, and and this is in the middle of winter, so they were going through, and some of them were stripping off, uh, you know shoots and really yeah so that crazy stuff so like coming back here and seeing where we're at yes it's kind of a bit early in terms of bud break and yeah there's a, not the moisture that we'd hope but yeah it's 
I think it's a bit more normal compared to some of the stuff happening in the West. So when you guys are talking about all these like varied conditions during vintage and things like that, what are, so generally like, I hear people say like, oh yeah, it's been really wet vintage this year. What are the characteristics that are going to end up in the finished product from a wet vintage versus a like hot Good dry question. vintage? Like, because everyone always talks about, oh yeah, like, dad's got down in his cellar, he's got his business card and on the back, it's got the scores for all of the vintages that he reckons like, oh yeah, odd numbers are a good year and even numbers are shit. <laughs> What are the actual results that you're getting from like wet or vintage? What happens to the wines at the end? Like, what is the? Well, I mean, yeah, if it gets really bad, it gets really you know you get mold, I suppose. But yeah. Tritus is probably the worst. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I think when I was like back, if I think back to eleven, because eleven's mm. quite an interesting <laughs> year. Like it's PTSD yeah. from that year. <laughs> yeah, but it was also the first time we'd sort of seen a year that had kind of got wet and cold. It was like mm. you know. It, there was a time everyone was talking global warming and it's just going to get like it's going to be a straight line mm. of everything's picked earlier and hot, earlier. Hot, hot, hot. And then you, we've had these sporadic kind of influences of major, you know, things like La Nina and rainfall and, and you know, years really jumping around. And I, so it's, uh, I reckon it's way more consistent if you look from 2010 backwards. You can kind mm. of pick out, you know, really easy trends. But now, like, you're just seeing such big influences of what happened in a season. Yeah. And they, they can be wet, they can be cold, they can be warm. They can be wet and warm. They can be cold and dry. You know, it's like there's, mm. there's the 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 line is pretty weird. Mm. Yeah. So the variation that you're getting year to year is changing up. And then I suppose is that meaning that the wines coming out of regions are just varying so much more than previously they would have been? Sort of. I suppose like like getting back to like what you're saying with 2011. After that, we started talking about climate change rather than global warming, right? I still remember having James Halliday saying that oh, global warming is a great thing. Uh, you know, in a room full of people, and everyone's like, I don't think we understand you, James. Um, you know, because he's like, well, down at Coldstream, you know, my sort of reference point was the fact that everything gets a little bit warmer, everything gets a bit riper, everything gets a bit better. Um, you know, what we're seeing, I suppose, is those extremes being even more extreme and more frequent. Mm. So you would usually have, I think the timeline between La Nina and El Nino switching used to be like five years. Mm -hmm. So we would, that, you know, if you remember like the 2000s drought, yep. that was like, you know, quite a significant amount of time uh, in Australia. And now it's sort of like, well, we had 2020. I mean, we had increasingly warmer years, 2018, 2019, 2020, and then 2020 was bushfires. Yeah. And so the result of that would be smoke taint in the wine yeah. uh, or like a very like increasing alcohol, uh, compressed vintages, you know, bringing in large amounts of fruit very, very quickly uh, in warmer places like the Barossa or Clare Valley, which actually triggered a change of the legislation in Australia to allow um, the addition of water to the grape must. If get this, but the grape must, do you know this about this rule? Yeah, How you yeah. But yeah, yeah, the grape must must be like 21 Bome. It's bonkers. It's like how, how do you get something? Is it 21 by Is that the rules? Yeah, like, oh, if, a good question about the rule of where it's good. But I, I think the fact that it was legislated that you could do it because I think behind closed doors it was probably happening in those hot water oh, yeah, years yeah. anyway. And so it's got, it's kind of uh, the, the flip side of the coin for me is France, you know, being able to add sugar in those really cold, oh, 100%, times. So yeah. it's like it, there's a bit of sense to it. But it's yeah, a bit I'm of leeway. Sure it's, it. it's bonkers. It's like it's like above 18 or 20 Bome, then you're allowed to start adding water at that point mm. to the must. I'm like, how the – what do you end up getting grapes <laughs> that ripe? That is wild, yeah. you know, but you've got growers that might be chasing really low yields because they have yield restrictions with whatever wineries that they've got. Uh, and they're just served up a really hot, dry year, which races the sugar away. Yeah. Um, the flip side, cold years. Yeah. So you've got, you got an, another whole sort of set of issues there. You've got potential for rot, I suppose. You've got, and, and different types of rot. Um, handling techniques in wineries, that would mean that there would be less time on skins, which is what we saw in 2011. Like Grenache started to, to go in a very different direction after that year in the Vale. Um, that, that year triggered a number of, uh, and even consumer changes as well, because suddenly everyone's released these Grenaches that are light in color, very delicate, less mm. time on skins. Uh, water in the bins, especially if it's raining, can dilute uh, everything, dilutes acidity, which is probably more egregious than, than sugar. Good point. I didn't really think about the fact that when it's wet, uh, there's water. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think about there being water in the grape bins. I'm like, yeah, 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 just pick it on a nice day. But no, the, it's raining all the, the time. Then there's the, there's long tail impacts too that I suppose like I remember in 2011 because we didn't get uh, energy in the vines. Uh, before they basically went dormant. Energy from then, the sun, yeah. Well, a vine, every bud has three buds, basically. And so your primary, secondary, tertiary buds. So if the, you lose your primary, 
uh, due to frost. You've got a secondary bud that can shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, if you you really want to be getting as much uh, energy into the vine as possible before it basically what we call senesces and goes into um, uh, goes into dormancy. And then yeah, I suppose like we ended up having way less yield across the industry in 2012 because of the impact of what happened in 2011. Exactly. So yeah. Mm. Yeah. But I'm, I'm back to your original point though. I think it's you got to pay more attention to to what happened in that year in that region. Like, yeah, you know, right. And it's a bit the same if you look to Europe as well, and it's probably just becoming more, you know, I think back in the day you used to be able to have these broad rules that, you know, across Australia, you know, 2010, the whole vintage was kind of like this, whereas now you need to know, you know, what happened in Tasmania, what happened in Mm. Victoria, what happened in the Adelaide Hills, what happened in Margaret River, and they're all... Because poor Margaret River in 2011, because, like, we all had a really shit one, and they had a bonkers one good one yeah, and yeah, everyone yeah, on the exactly. east coast was fried but then consumer confidence in the 2011 vintage yeah uh was absolutely shot so and if the, anyone the hunter had a good one in 11 too, oh they did which is which is, is yeah. rare, rare for that part of the world in, in a wet vintage yeah, for I sure i know that because my son's birth year so i like i've been collecting <laughs> places <laughs> like River and yeah, Valley yeah, yeah, yeah. Drops. <laughs> <laughs> probably get them for a good deal too. i would have thought yeah. absolute bargain yeah. all right so being the one of the the head honchos, co-head honcho, really, I guess, of Sean Smith, uh, as well as uh, winemaker there, are you sick and tired of Sauvignon Blanc yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think you know Savvy's. Uh, I'll obviously get asked this question a bit because we make a bit of Sauvignon Blanc, but uh, but I'm I'm sort of at peace with it because it, like uh, it certainly works in the hills and, and the hills like there's not that much plantable area, you know, mm. so it's kind of restricted within that. I remember when I first joined, I was like, you know, I hadn't had as much exposure to Sauvignon Blanc and it gets a bit poo-pooed by the winemakers, you know. Um, and I came and I joined and David Lemire, who's the, you know, joint CEO and master of wine and, you know, very big wine brain, and um, he said, oh, we're going to do this, like, workshop and it's going to be, you know, tasting Sauvignon Blanc from all around the world. And I was like, find me a stick now, I'm going to drive it into my eye, you know. But, uh, <laughs> but I think from there... It was actually a really fascinating thing to do because you, you probably don't do that, you know. People mm, don't do yeah. that. And so, you know, if you look at it, Sauvignon from the Loire, you look at it mm. from Bordeaux, you look at it from New Zealand, you look at it from Australia, you know, different parts of Australia, it really does. Like it's a variety that shows where it grows, you know. And mm. for me that's kind of one of the cool things about wine is wine's showing where they grow, mm. showing the mm. year. And so Adelaide Hills actually if you taste it through blind, like, um, you know, probably it looks new world, you know, so you see this freshness, but there's a subtlety to it which kind of is endearing, I think. Some of the Sauvignons that I are my least preferred are the obvious, heavy, big, bold things mm. that you kind of want a glass of but you don't want more of, you know. Mm. And I think Loire is kind of interesting because you look at those ones, there's, there's a minerality to them, there's, you know, drinkability, there's freshness, there's, you know, so... I think for me it does, like I've had people ring and say, have you got some, I need some really punchy Sav Blanc to do whatever. And I'm like, mate, we don't make that stuff. Like it just doesn't come naturally mm. to the to the vines that we grow and the, the wines that we make. So, yeah, I'll probably, I, I, I was, unex, I, I didn't expect to kind of, you know, think about it as much as I have. And But mm. when you do unpack it, you know, you see different parts of the hills ripen at different times. You know, the higher, cooler sites bring nettles and sort of spicy stuff, the, the middle part of the hills kind of brings this gin and tonic spectrum, which we love. You know, it's that kind of uh, gin and tonic. Uh, serve one. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, look, I think it's uh, it's something that we do, but every like everything we do, we kind of you know put the lens over it. Like we mm. want to grow grapes and and make wines that look like where they come from. Mm. Mm. It's enough to make me actually want to drink some more Sauvignon Blanc. Did you well, hear that? Well, yeah, <laughs> no, it's just a, like- what you're saying is very interesting in the sense that, oh, yeah, we did a vertical of Sauvignon Blanc, which isn't something you'd think of doing. And you're absolutely right. I would never think of doing a vertical <laughs> of Sauvignon Blanc because to me, like as a uh, someone growing up in Australia and the Sauvignon Blancs that I've been exposed to, I think are very much so those punchy, like, oh, it smells mm. like passion fruit. Yeah. Hello, Sauvignon Blanc. Nice to see you again. And the idea of like going through the right, like there's other wines that I've tasted differently and gone, oh yeah, it makes sense to do a vertical of Riesling because I've tasted those different regions. But I suppose like just being a 29 year old who's grown up in South Australia, I've never really been exposed to those variations of Sauvignon Blanc. So it's really interesting to hear you talk about like the scope in that wine mm. because it's, as you said, like when you rocked up and you're like, oh, I'd rather poke my eye out than drink a whole pile of Sauvignon Blanc. That's very much so the sort of attitude that's been passed on to me as someone coming into the industry. And it's weird that that bias exists. Yeah. 
Because is it is it because it's popular? Is it just because like because we do as an industry love to slam it, but we also love to like champion the underdog, but also champion the new. Mm. Um, you know, I wonder if like you know, it's pretty obvious that Sauvignon Blanc has pretty much kept the lights turned on and staff paid at most venues in the country, if not the <laughs> yeah. world. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like- there probably is a bit of that like high mindedness of wine society where it's just like, oh, the thing that everyone wants to drink. Pff, come on, I don't drink that shit. I drink the stuff that no one's drinking. But what know? about like elevating it? Because I don't think of any any winery out there that's managed to hold their price point. You know, still have a very premium price point when it comes to Sauvignon Blanc. I imagine it must pay most of the bills at Shaw and Smith still to this day. Oh. Oh, certainly it's part you know it's a, the lion's share of what we do and uh in terms of volume but yeah i think it, it, we do like you know still the the, the vast majority of it's hand picked you know mm. it's, uh we do tr- you do see the differences and you know we, the other thing that's interesting is yield you know i don't think we we don't just get massive yields in the hills you know mm. and so i think that limiting of, of yield kind of helps that be more balanced and you know when we <clears throat> we don't need to add anything to it you know it's like the natural acidity is there you jump in early you know, it's a it's pretty much a dry white wine. It's you know, so I've kind of made peace with it. But uh, it's a it is certainly something that has allowed us to kind of um, you know drill into other things and 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 explore uh, other wine mm. bits. You know, Michael and Martin, you know, M- Michael being an MW and and Martin being a super interested you know wine guy as well. Are uh, just you know we're all about vineyards and we're about trying to you know explore different things and. And what works best where, and and you know, so that that's been part of the fun of the journey of Sean Smith for sure. Mm. Hey, have you ever been tempted to to play around with oak fumé blanc styles, or is it sort of like don't touch the thing that clearly works? Oh no, we've done that. We have done it, and uh, we did when I first arrived. We made Michael Hill Smith still loves it. It was pretty pretty funny, but uh, yeah, we did the full skin contact, no additions. And, uh, and yeah, it was, but we had a little bit of semi on as well as some Sav Blanc and we did. Yeah. And, uh, uh is that made, unreleased? Have you released? No, that? we did. We made it and we sold, we sold, sold it out, uh, pretty, pretty well. But, uh, we just looked at the wine and just, uh, I'm not sure we thought it was better. Do you know, mm. like uh, we just, at the end it was textural. It was, you know, had some of the skin tannins. Mm. It was, you know, phenolic and it was, but. I don't know if the sheer drinking pleasure of just a glass of wine yeah. was that much better, you the know. Old, so yeah, the scientists never stop to ask the question if they should. They just asked if they could. Type deal. It's just like, <laughs> yeah, we can do this. Should we? <laughs> should we? Yeah. No, absolutely. Not. Well, I can't. Uh, uh, well, there's part of that too t- in in me that like I arrived and I'm sort of s- I'm witnessing what's been built here mm. and seeing, you know, Sean Smith's been around, you know, for you know t- twenty years before mm. I got there, mm. sort of thing, and um. And uh, uh, and so for me it was like stand back and and look and see what works and see what suits the place and you know I didn't feel like I needed to mess with it you know like mm. the, it's that 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 way of keeping pure pure expression of wines you know get the you know it's, it's pretty reductive but it's pretty you know sensitive and it's all you know like low sulfur and it it all works and it all it's been working for years so if it ain't broke don't fix it you know yeah but there there was like a a a bit of a a change though when you did arrive we noticed it in the wines because prior to you i think it was daryl catlin was was winemaker there for for quite a while almost i think almost since the inception and you seem to because it was also not your first radio rolling into a winery that's existed for a fair amount of time and really sort of taking it to another level how did you go about deciding what needed to change yeah, well, that's an interesting one. Yeah, I think, yeah, first of all, it, it, yeah, there was some things that I, like I first, I didn't think I, but when I first arrived at Shore and Smith, I didn't think that they needed me. You know, I was like, you guys don't need me. You know, <laughs> you, got doing some, right. <laughs> you guys have got some of the biggest wine brains. Sitting around this room was, you know, Michael Hill Smith, yeah. Martin Shaw, David Lemire. I'm like. Because I had, I think, panel was consulting as well yeah, at a certain point in time. And yeah, yeah, so it was a pretty amazing group, group of people. And then, and then I guess, I think for us, there was a realization as a group that we could go further, and uh, and so that that was probably the, the starting point, you know. Mm. Interesting. So talking about like coming into a winery as the head winemaker to sort of uh, you know you've been employed to do something in sports. It seems like quite often there'll be a new coach or a new GM that comes into uh, an organization, and it seems like there's a bit of pressure on them to put a bit of like their stamp, like they've got to hire a new coach or they've got to find a new player. When you're coming into a spot as a new head winemaker, is there almost a little bit 
Like, as you're saying, Sean and Smith doing great. If not broke, don't fix it. But is there a bit of pressure on you to come in and sort of put your own mm. stamp on the wines yeah. coming out? Or oh, the- definitely. I think that's what they were looking for. You know, mm. like they're looking to take the next step. And as you quite rightly pointed out, like I, I think the really important thing was the discussion before I joined, you know, like to say, I'm not coming to just stand on the crusher mm. and, you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 point yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Well, bottle, yeah. yeah, yeah, this is, this is going to, we're going to be all committed to, to taking this thing further and, you know, there's probably going to be some challenges that we all need to get our head around and, you know, I, but, but it was met with, like, those guys are up for it, you know. They'd mm. kind of, uh, they want to do better and they want to take it further and so we just set about, you know, all those things. Ray Guerin had joined as well, so viticultural muscle, you know, and then we we kind of set about. I knew there was a few things that were kind of low hanging fruit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was bad. <laughs> um, but apart, aside from that, you know, like there was there was some stuff we we're going to nail pretty early in the piece that I thought would be okay. And then yeah. uh, I remember one of the things saying to Michael and Martin before I joined. I said, you know, in the first year there might be some things that we're like, oh, yeah, we really nailed that. But I'll tell you, in year six, seven, eight, that's yeah. where you're going to see it because we're going to start unlocking, you know, the potential of different regions. We're going to like sub-regions and little, you know, micro climates and then we're going to understand how we're going to farm that better and then we're going to join the dots on what makes that sort of tick in the winery. Mm. And, and But that takes time, you know. You can't just do it mm. overnight. So, uh, yeah, that was that was what we set about doing and, you know, and particularly like some of the the, the low the the stuff that was easy to, to to do was probably just get in and pick things a bit earlier like you know mm. prizing just change that perspective of of thinking about you know natural acidity as wanting as one of the kind of hallmarks of what we do you know like prizing natural acidity as opposed to this i don't know Brendan you probably remember but back in the sort of early days everyone used to talk about flavor oh I'm waiting for flavor I'm always yeah, there yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. like what do you, what where where is this mythical flavor? Does it yeah, just yeah, arrive yeah. one day? And I just I've never ever thought like that with grapes. I always feel like it's balance. You know, you mm. want to be looking at balance, and you want to see all of those components together. It's like you know when you go to a restaurant, you go and go, I just want more flavor. You know, like you because <laughs> you, you, you want it to be a beautiful experience, don't mm. you? You want it to everything to be in place, and sometimes it's. You know, it's balance that, that gets you there. I, I think it was because we were everyone back in the day was chasing just hitting the volume up button on everything. It was like whatever we can sort of extract more of. And then you have these sort of wines that are quite homogenous and just too, too filling. They're, they're yeah. you, almost, in a sense, a, a weird way of understanding it. We were clouding the idea of like terroir expression. And it was weird. Like I, I did big winery vintages. I still remember hauling like literally a quarter ton of tartaric. Uh, up a up a whole bunch of stairs just to plow into you know a tank and you know then going the next day to university and they were talking about like the distribution of acidities in grapes I'm like well surely it's just tartaric and they're like no well there's like 13 different acids or something I'm like well why isn't there a why aren't you adding 13 different acids into the wine then uh, and of lo and behold the only reason you add like this one particular acid is it's because it's very predictable. Mm. Like you can do a, a very predictable change of your pH. I'm like, well, what if the pH doesn't need changing? Wouldn't that be a better alternative? Because not all acid tastes the same. Yeah. You know, it all has a different weight and shape and feel. And then that's obviously when you start to see when you harvest it that little bit earlier or preference as great varieties that can ripen at that precisely at that time, you end up having this much more interesting picture on the palate. Mm. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that your point about, picking things late like it's something you can do across the globe and kind of homogenize mm. all grapes you know once they get to a point where it's just sugar mm. and dehydrated things and concentrated things it's like mm. yeah, they lose kind of the, the the lens in which to see the place yeah so speaking of like you've got some pretty impressive accolades in your time <laughs> Uh, but two that really stood out of course was uh, Ducks of Len Evans tutorial which uh, for those playing at home, yeah. is, is probably yeah, what is the Len Evans tutorial? Yeah. <laughs> What's a duck? No. <laughs> oh, no, well, yeah. What what is ducks in your is words? Class, what yeah. is yeah? That is yeah. Top of the class. It was yeah, actually beautiful. joint ducks yeah. uh, as well. It's the yeah. first and I think almost only time it's ever happened. Yeah. Which I want to get into understanding how that happened and what that felt like. But for the for folks who don't know, would you mind describing what the Len Evans tutorial even is? Yeah, it's 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 probably it, it's a hard one to encapsulate. You know all of it but it's kind of like the the fanciest wine school you can kind of ever get into in the world i would say you know like you get to try wines and 
Uh, you know, there's 12 people that get selected once a year. Lots, everyone applies. Um, and it, I think it, it, it's named after Len Evans, who, who you know, kind of is a bit of a legend of Australian wine. And, and really he, his legacy was to kind of, you know, particularly it was interesting because he wanted to bring young people up to a standard of understanding wines of the world and, and increasing their knowledge of Australian mm. wine, wine people um, and, and getting them to be able to kind of, you know, consider how they might take some of that, you know, kind of context on a world basis and, and bring it back to kind of, you know, whether you're making, whether you're, you know, a SOM, whether you're a, you know, wine writer, whether you're selling the stuff, you know, there's a, a whole, whole gamut. So, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a week and you start and you taste blind in the, in the morning and you judge and then there'll be a masterclass in the afternoon sort of deep diving into places and then, at night there'll be uh, options games and so you've got these wines that are presented in front of you and, yeah, it's pretty. Sounds great. It's, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really fun. It's <laughs> gruelling though. It's yeah, gruelling. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And nerve-wracking because you've got yeah. sort of like these people out the front that are like, you know, legends of wine mm. and, and you're kind of looking at them and you're nervous and you don't want to embarrass yourself and yet you still want to learn and, yeah, it's a pretty crazy experience. So it, it sounds like it's uh, essentially like a, almost a scholarship program that's been set up to try and pass knowledge on to the future generation, which is very important in wine especially because mm. it is an accumulate. Like if I had to start a winery tomorrow, it would be fucked. But like learning <laughs> off you and learning off you is the way that you would get better at it. But yeah, when that's the principle of it, and you say you're nervous because there are all of these legends there. What's the what's the vibe in the room? Like, it is is it like an exam? Like, is everyone? Oh my god, you could you could power a small city from the vibe in the room. Like, it's like <laughs> so much energy. It's like because everyone is nervous, and you know, like the example is you first sat down, and and you know, with the first judging was Shiraz, I think. And the second wine, blind, was Grange. You know, in this, in this and you think, oh, dude, like the culmination, <laughs> the, the actual final day tasting is every individual vineyard of Domaine della Romani Conti open in front of you. Right. I think that in that one tasting, they open close to like fifty grand's worth of wine, just for twelve people. Mm. And okay. then your job is to pin the tail on the donkey. Yeah, it really puts in scale what we do here on camera. <laughs> <laughs> like we're just pissing, farting a thunderstorm compared to that shit. My yeah. God. Yeah, that's it's it's probably the most. I reckon it'd be close to. I don't think there's anything in the world like it. I think we're pretty lucky that yeah. that Len Evans had like initially set it up. Uh, but you duxed it. You pinned the talent. Well, co duxed it. Yes. What's co dux like? <laughs> yeah, I mean that was kind of cool too. I probably you know I uh, think we had a pretty talented group and uh, yeah, and a pretty diverse group. And, uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, so I, I don't think you, by about day two, you you might go into it. I don't know if people go into it wanting to win it, but I reckon by about, you know, 30 seconds into day one, you're like, okay, I, I don't want to win this thing. I just want to, you know, learn and, and talk when I'm asked and, mm -hmm. and hopefully not stuff it up not kind of thing and, le yeah, yeah, through, and, yeah. and learn. So, um, so I think. Yeah, a combination of those things, you start to grow in a bit of confidence and you start to kind of, it happens throughout the week and your learning's like this. And someone said it to me, and I, I absolutely agree, is that you'd be much better at doing the Len Evans tutorial after you've done the Len Evans tutorial because yeah. you kind of like, it's yeah. like this massive learning that happens. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And so I think the, the you know, Stu Halliday, who was the other Ducks, is very different to me and he he had nailed some some really big things on, on the evenings you know mm -hmm. and and done a great job in, in some of those option games and and you know his world perspective you know he was the at tetsu years and he was you know mm -hmm. the som there and and so he had a really you know great understanding of probably much more uh, uh international understanding than i did and i probably did pretty well on the judging during the day you know and all that and and, and i you know had worked at broken wood which was that that had given me an exposure to some of those wines, but it was a pretty incredible week. And the, the best thing about ducting it was the fact that we got to share because the win the prize is you get to go and visit some of these domains and uh, wherever you want to go, and they open the doors for you. So um, so doing it together with someone else and sharing that experience and mm. learning, and, and we got a few more doors open because Stu would say, you know, like, oh, we might pour this at Tetsuya's. Now they seem more <laughs> interested to see. Fancy to see that. him than a winemaker. From <laughs> we might grab all of your ideas and incorporate them in Shaw and Smith one day. Uh, <laughs> Versus let us buy your shit. Let us buy yeah. your stuff. <laughs> yeah. More appetizing. All right. The, so Jimmy Watson is another sort of big prestigious and very Australian-centric thing as well. Um, do you know what the Jimmy Watson is? 
I have heard it thrown around so much and you and Noah multiple times have been like, you know, this is a Jimmy Watson wine. And I'm like, no way. Fuck Jimmy Watson wine. <laughs> it, it sounds like it's an award for vineyards. Well, it's interesting because I'm, I'm not – Sure, if it's the like on paper, I wouldn't actually call it the absolute pinnacle. Not to say wind out of your sails or anything, but it's it's sort of like it, there is there is actually like pinnacle awards that just don't really get as much. I think it's like like um, uh, as much exposure. So mm. there is an award for the winner of all the wine shows that get sort of put around in the Royal Ag Society. But this particular award stood out. I'm not sure exactly why. It's probably because we were very red wine centric. Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's one just one of those things that it, it, it cut through in wine mm. and it's sort of the one that made, you know, I think Wolf Blass won mm. it a couple of times or whatever back in the 80s and and, I, and it's the one that made the sort of the TV news, you know, on the yeah. the, the, mm. the final wine thing that cut through. Um, mm. So I think that's kind of its origins. Of, it's of, the one of, that plebs like me have heard of. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, I suppose. So it's, correct me if I'm wrong, is it a, it's a under two-year-old red wine? That wins. It's the basically it the best. Off, it started off being the you know the 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 young wine of the of the, that's the the origin. But then after that, yeah, it was bottled wines that were mm. at least one years old. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So the idea, I think, is that and I, and is it only red or is it just bottled wines? Red. Mm. Yeah. So I think the idea is that when people see that award being won, they're like, that's the wine that has the greatest potential long term both for drinking, cellaring purposes, but also monetary, knowing that it was rated at this point in time through a sampling of industry professionals mm. as the best bottled red within a year. Uh, and it is like some of the wines are stunning, like Panels won it a bunch of times. How old were you when you won it? Uh, it was 2011, actually, was the wine, so I was 2012. That's right. Yeah, so, yeah, I think I was in 30s, like in early 30s, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you rock up next? You were at best Great Western then. Yeah. I remember that wine, and it was lean. It was a fresh. Well, it was 2011. Like, yeah, yeah so, right. Well, there's a bit Your of a vineyards were underwater, weren't they? <laughs> well, it was a tough year. It was it was really interesting. 2010, yeah, I, uh, I was at best, and um, I'd, we were sort of wanting to upgrade a few things and so I'd spoken to Viv and I said, oh, I reckon we just, because we had such small, cool little sites around the winery and I thought if we could just do a bit more hand picking and sorting and then just stemming and keeping things separate, sorting tables, I think we can just get this to the next level, you know, and I'd sort of, you know, I won the tutorial in 09. So I was kind of a lot of this thinking had kind of been formed over this this little period and Anyway, 2011, Viv, Viv came in and said, you've just wasted, you know, however many dollars on sorting table and all this <laughs> stuff and, and uh, we never use that and oh, we make all right ones. And I was just like, holy cow, you know, like my job's at risk kind of thing. But I knew deep down I was kind of doing the right thing. And then 2011 rolled around. And it was right. the perfect year to be Got able to. All the sorting to tables. To be sorting and doing that stuff. And so, so yeah, uh, it was just a fantastic, you know, kind of, opportunity to to maximize like there was some stuff going on you probably remember there was the people mm. that were spot um you know pasteurizing stuff and mm. you were, if you left a red yeah. wine out that had full of botrytis you'd see, you'd, you'd learn how you know how o oxidation over, overnight would just happen from these lacases that are formed mm. in the botrytis so crazy nerdy stuff but um but yeah the sorting table and the great sites just worked a treat so that wine was just balanced and it was mm. very peppery and light mm. and yeah there was a beautiful. leanness to it but it was kind of beautiful as well and uh, yeah. so in my head uh sorting table most likely thing that you're sorting there size of grapes what are, you sorting? <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about here fellas <laughs> As you are, I'm what's a sorting table? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's a sorting no, table? So I guess yeah. in in the year that we had, which was 2011, was just there was so much rain, and so there was so much botrytis and just weird molds all through vineyards, particularly in low pockets mm -hmm. and whatever. So your first thing is your hand picking, so you, mm. you're able to go around some of that stuff, but inevitably you don't look mm. at every bunch. Every so. Single. So as those bunches came through, you you were just you're looking at each bunch, you're turning them over, and anything that wasn't perfect was pulled out, mm. and that means that you get a chance to get just perfect berries kind of into the ferments, and yeah, you're naturally able to select out by hand, and uh, but it's it's pretty hard work. We you know mm. you're sort of standing around the table and uh, yeah and doing the hard yards, but you, there was no other way to do it, you yeah. know, really. So it was pretty. The sorting table, the table of truth, we used to call it because you'd kind of like be so bored that you'd be start telling truthful stories about yourself. And, 
yeah, there were some interesting stories. Over oh, that's table. pretty funny. That's <laughs> I've never really thought of it that way, but most of the great conversations I've had in wineries have been over sorting tables. <laughs> right. So the only thing I can the only thing I can relate it to is my first ever job. Um, I was actually a level three shellfish attendant at an oyster farm over in Coffin Bay. And as the oysters are coming through, you're doing the same thing. Like some oysters are shit and you've got to pull them out and they're all coming through a big conveyor belt. Uh, not a lot of conversations happening there because it's an industrial spot and it's very noisy. But uh, mm. I think doing it with Grace Beer, much more mellow, but potentially. I, I've yeah. seen those sort of setups. It's very similar. It's a very similar setup. It's yeah. a vibrating, it's like a vibrating table um, and slightly yeah. angled. And so basically the grapes just kind of shuffle their way down past you. Mm. And then you've got people standing either side, um, basically trying to identify. Um, yeah, basically infected berries and yeeting Bunch by off. bunch, grape by grape. Bunch by bunch, bunch to by start bunch. with. Yeah, you yeah. can do yeah. both. Um, yeah, but but usually it's bunch by bunch. Mm. Yeah. Mm. There's some really cool like pieces of kit these days that have like, uh, takes like shit loads of photos really quickly and then it, as it falls off the sort of edge of the, the sorting table, little air jets, like Mate, hundreds of exactly little air jets. exactly what they had at the oyster farm 10 years ago. <laughs> Dead set, you've got, uh, you've got the conveyor belt where you're pulling all the ones out that are like empty or whatever, but then it goes down and then it's got this series of cameras that takes photos of every single you oyster shit me. coming through. And then there's about nine bags lined up along there and it gets graded from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And as it goes along, it's like, yep, that's a medium-sized oyster jet of air, shoots it straight into a bag, and then that goes back out onto the leases. Oyster farming, very interesting stuff. Not really relevant to you're, 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 I mean, I'm just surprised. Oh, I thought yeah, that was a joke. Okay. that shellfish knowledge. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. All right, so you win the, the Jimmy Watts and you're vindicated and Viv says what? Uh, not much, really. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I did, to be fair, I did leave and uh, before the wine was put to bottle. And uh, mm. so I, I went across to Sepulk for a year. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was just, I've always been interested in vineyards. And I think the reason I joined Bess was, you know, I, Viv took me around and, you know, we we, we uh, talked about stuff and there was this dry growing bit of, you know, 1868 plant of Shiraz and, and the, and the um, Pinot Mounier and I just mm. thought, he's like, yeah, we well, get a chance to make this and so I was, bang, I was in, yeah, all yeah, in yeah. and then when I, after I'd been there for sort of six or seven years and, you know, I'd looking across the road at, at what, what, you know, St. Peter's Vineyard and the Drumble mm. Vineyard and I was like, mm. man, I would love to just, you know, see what could be done there. And, mm. and so, yeah, so uh, anyway, I was kind of, I left and, and then yeah, Viv sat me down in the in the room and he goes, well, I'm pissed off you're leaving, but but at least you're staying in Great Western. <laughs> 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 just going across the road. So uh, so that was that was as good as a high five from Viv. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, um, so, yeah, but it didn't last. I obviously got the call, mm. you know, one year I spent there and, and then, yeah, got the call from Michael and Martin and, yeah, I convinced you to come across. Convinced me to come across. Yeah, mm. man, I thought you were going to mention the oldest Dolcetto vines in the world as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you hear about this? So you go if you go to Sepults. Uh, sorry, uh, Best Grey Western. Um, literally, as you pull up to the cellar door, there's this sort of plaque, uh, this vineyard right there, and they were like they thought it was I think Malbec. Yeah, for like. 70 years and they're like, hey, Malbec, mm. <laughs> it's Dolcetto. I don't even know how it ended up there. Yeah, well, the, the nursery plantings there are unreal, you know, yeah. and that's super fascinating. It's just a, such a beautiful place to learn about vines. And, yeah, the Dolcetto is a, is a good example of it wasn't – it was the early 90s when it was identified as uh, so pretty crazy. Dolcetto. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. then we, we used to have the young vine, Pinot Munier, which was like 40 years old, and I love the year young vine. Young <laughs> vine. <laughs> right, yeah, okay. That's amazing. Amazing. So you come across from from uh, Great Western to Shaw and Smith. What's it like having so many incredibly smart people in a room? Is it too many cooks in the kitchen sort of vibe, or do you, do you ever have debates, arguments? Yeah, yeah, I think we definitely do. Like, I, th I think it, it's a it's a really interesting place. So I think uh, because I think as long as you go into it with a uh, a feeling of respect, you know, and you you're all focused on the same thing, which is mm. trying to make grow better grapes and make better wine, then you're happy to have an argument. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Because you know that the outcome you're trying to get is potentially a better one. Mm. So I think if you go in there with a mindset that you're open to just making the best wine you can, then then it works. I think, yeah, the, if you if you were a control freak that didn't – well, well, there's an element of control in there as well, you know. So you, we, we certainly want to control things and we don't, you know, but – it's the the formulation of the ideas that is the really important part of uh, mm. those guys, and we all taste wine together. And um, 
one of the things that that really aligns us is tasting other people's wines together you know because you you kind of when you're in your own space you can kind of you know you've got your neck of the woods mm. i've got my neck of the woods i've got my biases you've got your biases mm. and you kind of that can kind of bubble up a little bit over time and mm. and i think one of the things that you know if we ever go visit some other wineries in tasmania or whatever you know we kind of we leave and we all talk about the experience about how they're growing the grapes and you know mm. what what that wine it was like and and then that kind of brings us together in terms of you know shaping our feelings and and thoughts together and yeah but it's definitely a group you need the right uh yeah you know the right dynamics and the mm. right attitude for that group to kind of work but because it is a, a yeah it's a pretty strong minded group as well and just wildly intelligent so so to bring you up to speed there's two masters of wine yeah, that's uh, fancy. I've seen some. That's, <laughs> that's terrifying. Yeah. Got two MWs there. Well, hey. Yeah. So uh, obviously from Straw and Smith, uh, since you joined, there seems to be a proliferation of new projects as well. You've obviously with Toll Puddle, uh, then uh, the other wine co. Yep. Uh, now Mad. Yes. As well, of which you're involved in Mad in a bit more of a significant way. Yeah. What was the sort of, because it was, you know, Shaw and Smith was, was sort of in my head always known as the Sauvignon Blanc company. And I would actually say it's probably much more a Chardonnay company now. Um, and the wines, the M3s, absolutely stunning. Um, but so is the, like the one that flies under the radar is probably the other wine co. That mm. little thing that you matured on floor. How, yeah. Like how do you come up with like who, who approves these projects? Do you just come by and like, yep, cool, we're bringing in some Savignon now, we're going to go do it? Like what? how does that work? Uh, well, yeah, it's collaborative and uh, I think the we kind of think we try to put, yeah, allow creativity, you know, within our group and uh, and the other wine co is kind of a safe space, you know. It's <laughs> for creativity and for the ability to kind of think, think outside the square mm-hmm. and, um, yeah, so – uh, I think the floor, for example, was was something, you know, I'd worked in the Jura um, and I knew it was something that, you know, had had been very interesting. Mm. And we'd sort of seen a few people have a crack at it in, in the Australian wine landscape. And one of the things, like as a group, when we're tasting, we were thinking like a lot of the, top, the examples we'd seen had kind of looked uh, potentially – uh, a little more developed, a little more, you know, volatility at at, mm. at, at at one edge of it, you know, and then, you know, thinking about. So what we started to think about was what if we just made one like, like, um, Vangion sort of, but make it more drinkable and make it more like a step and make it fresh and make it, you know, think about mm. some some kind of, uh, not go straight to the seven years under floor, you know, mm. kind of extreme, I can't get my head around it kind of way, but let's have a step to there and, you know, and drew some kind of inspiration from, you know, Fino Sherry as well and, you know, that, that idea. And so Matt Large, who, uh, you know, is uh, is part of the team, uh, went and looked and did some investigating, looked at some stuff, you know, found some different types of yeast that were floating around that, and there's a bit of a library, you know, down at the AWRI and those guys kind of were at, allowed us to kind of You're kidding. experiment with a couple of yeast that they had, you know. Yeah, so uh, That's cool. <laughs> so we went deep on it, you know, and uh, and just with Is now, this to establish the floor? Cuz yeah. it was that like your biggest concern was like we can get it to 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 ferment dryness and everything crisp and clean, but we just don't know anything about establishing floor. Uh well, it was just about understanding floor. Yeah, and we just didn't know what we didn't know. Uh so we just there was some stuff that had been brought back from like from Spain and th- there was this little library of old, you know, top fermenting floor yeast that were I'm probably going to get in trouble for talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking of all of well, I need to contact the AWRI now. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's it's it was a fascinating thing, and then so you know, we started. You start growing it like a, a little bit, and then you put it on a a, a larger portion of wine, and then you yeah, then yeah. take that and then you inoculate some things, and yeah, and so yeah, it's been a it's been a fascinating project. And then we, you know, we we sort of started putting the blends together. Like blend number one was like this, and then we we're like, well, it doesn't that don't have to be the same? Let's think about, and then maybe let's push the boat out a bit further and see if that this one gets more complex, and then. You know, we just did a floor number three and that was kind of like one barrel that we loved, you know. And so, yeah, it's just that's just one example, I guess. Is it still going? Are you still doing yeah, it? Yeah, we've still got. You'd yeah. have a look at this wine, mate. It's 
amazing. Um, because the Jura thing was the the Vinjura that you were talking about. Fun yeah. Yeah, it was the thing that we were drinking the other day that is like bizarre. Yeah, that one. It is pretty bizarre. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you haven't that, encountered it before, it's pretty bizarre. Yeah, it's yeah. like it, it's cheese board end of night stuff. Like it's very interesting. <laughs> like yeah. these guys love it. Like this is the thing when we do tastings on the show, right? Like I'll drink it and I'm like, what the fuck's that? I'll pay $140 for it because it's weird, but I'll have one bottle of it. And they're like, oh, mate. Back up the trailer, bring it in. <laughs> when did you drink this shit? Um, also, uh, probably the most embarrassing realization I've had in one of these conversations is while as you're talking about like underfloor. Mm. I was like, what the fuck does putting barrels underneath the floor do to anyone? Like for years, you guys have talked about, oh yeah, spend a bit of time on the floor. And I'm like, why? Why? Like, I know sellers downstairs, sure, yeah. but like, you're obviously talking about something completely different here, aren't you? <laughs> Oh yes. my God. So floor, floor yeast is a yeast that veils across the top of a, uh, a wine okay. uh, that actually protects it from uh, oxidation. It's what they call an uh, obligate anaerobe, I believe. So it's so more of a ceiling than a floor. <laughs> yeah, that is. <laughs> Sorry, again. It's a lid, yeah. 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 <laughs> Sits on top. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. But it's also, it's, uh, I'm not sure where the word comes from. It obviously must be Spanish. F L O R. Mm. It's not. It's not mm. double O R. But I understand the the absolute confusion is very legitimate. Yeah, yeah. but it is weird because when you sample it, you kind of don't want to mess with the, the the floor. So you we we put it like a nail in there and we pull it out and you know and taste out of the little you know, underneath. The oh, that's a smart way to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah right. Mm. That's it. There you go. Mm, yeah. I'm learning heaps from this conversation. It's not <laughs> something that I thought I'd be learning, but here we are. So obviously, gone from it seems like the approach here is very much. It's if we're going to do something, we're going to do it like at the pursuit of excellence. So it's like if we're going to do Pinot, we're going to do it this way. If we're going to do Chardonnay, we're going to do it this way. Um, if we're going to do anything on a floor, we're going to do it this way. Is this what's also fueling like the focus on Grenache and Shannon now? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think if I can pick up on the Chardonnay thing because I think I just love Chardonnay. And so that was kind of like your your little point there is that's about exploring place. And, and you know, I just I think we've – in the hills, we're lucky to kind of have all these little sub-regions that just really are super, you know, exciting. And then, you know, you look to places like Tasmania as well and, you know, Tolpuddle is an example of, of being able to, you know, see something totally different, show that, sen- that sense of place and then unpack the differences you need to kind of get that to be the best version of itself, both farming-wise mm. and, and wine-wise. Um, but one thing we hadn't kind of, you know, in, as a group, you know, we hadn't, explored i guess and this is part of the the um curiosity i guess of of our group is is the kind of old vine you know Mm. which i'd seen at best and been part of and Mm. i know it's you know a a pretty critical interesting part of the equation um yeah and grenache i mean i was born in mclaren vale and i grew up there and i kind of yeah i just it was funny. Some of those things you look back at and you, you didn't understand them because you're a young seller hand, but you kind of, there's some penny drop moments. Like I, I always loved those wines from Blewett Springs, but at mm. the time they weren't considered, um, you know, they weren't on, on fashion because mm. they weren't the darkest and the deepest and the most intense. And, and I love them because they were like kind of light and, and floral and, you know, beautiful. And Grenache, I always thought like this was, it was, there was a strange kind of, um, obsession with you know like i remember one of the old fellas saying you know if you think your grenache is ripe then wait two weeks and it'll be ready you know like Mm. and it's like holy cow that's a like that to me just doesn't make any sense and uh i remember it was actually interesting i was in the jura with the family and i took two wines i took a you know i was working at weir at the time so i took it was in uh 2000 it was funny because i was watching the olympics back in australia when i was in france (laughs) um uh, and it was a really good judo guy <laughs> really good. from France. <laughs> all these Australians. And all into it. You're never seeing any Australians yet. Maybe Kathy Freeman once. But, uh, yeah, it was pretty bizarre. Anyway, um, yeah, I took these wines and, and the Cabernet, which was, you know, Cabernet was actually made really well, like, like back in the sort of late 90s and uh, in that little area. And, and it looked beautiful. And I remember I pulled this Grenache and I was really excited to show them the Grenache. But the Grenache just looked it looked alcoholic. It looked and it had fallen over. It lacked freshness. It didn't mm. live. And, uh, and that sort of stuck with me as well. Um, and then, yeah, we sort of in the, in the world of, you know, kind of the, the other wine co, you know, this is the safe space, I think freely. And mm. uh, we thought what, what could be done with Grenache? And so mm. in 15, we went down and 
bought some old wine Grenache. Well, not not super old wine, forty year old. Because it, it, what you did release under wine. other wine co a Grenache. Yeah, in twenty first. Yeah, yeah. And it won the the uh, hot one hundred that year. It did. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we sort of started looking, and Ray Guerin, who's the the Vitty muscle, uh, just an absolute gun too, was from down there as well. So he had all yeah. mates living around Blewett Springs. He played footy with. And uh, so, yeah, these guys would just take us around their properties and show us this stuff and it was just incredible, you know, and uh, really hard to get hold yeah. of, you know. And and in this time period, David Lemire kept banging on about Shannon, like get some Shannon and no one would. There wasn't much. Sounds like London. Dave Lemire and Noel would get along like the house on fire. Yeah. yeah. Shannon heads. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, and then it wasn't until sort of, you know, this – end of 2020 start of 21 that we that this property came up for sale and it had yeah three hectares of 1939 planted grenache dry grown and some mm. of the most you know balanced vines you know um yeah with this in this little pocket of of Blewett springs where there's this ironstone as well as sand and um mm. that's kind of the for us the a bit of the the, the magical um you know ingredients that mm. kind of come along and uh and so and then there was some Shannon, so David Lemire, and we were all like, yeah, let's go. So uh, first started on Shannon and, uh, yeah, and we didn't know where to start again, a bit like those projects. And and so we knew it was going to be totally different to Chardonnay, you know. I mm. think the fact that so we had some old vines and we thought let's look at what, what, the, what, what we can do with the skins, you know, that's where some of this flavour is going to come mm. from. Mm. So we crushed a bit took the big amounts of juice and fermented it in concrete, you know, just to see how that would go and, wow it was pretty pretty crazy and so we sort of needed to be a bit you know uh yeah just get the best out of that and then and then there's a another portion that we we picked and whole bunch squeezed and just to keep that idea that you know because we we looked at shannons from around the world so we were sort of inspired by south africa and and it was amazing where some of those really ripe shannons the, mm. the characters they go to so mm -hmm. that was kind of a, a, a bit of a thing but then we probably more resonated with Loire and and this this sort of waxy, you know, nice backbone minerality, keeping acidity as part of the DNA of the wine, and and we felt like maybe some of those South Africans, for us, you know, uh, they're not acid based, they're very flavour based, very mat, like they're they're such a mouthful of wine, and just when you visit our site, you, you know, being close to the sea, something about it just felt right to to pick it. You know, you know where the acidity is still, you know, a really big part of the mm. game, mm. and you still are getting flavour from some of those old vines. So, mm. yeah, just try to unlock all those, and then I think we were ambitious with it. You know, we wanted to make sure that it it had had a long elevage as well. I, I at best, I'd have made a bit of Shannon actually, and uh, I'd seen the longer you left it, the more interesting the wine kind of got mm. in, in in elevage, you know, maturation. So. That was something that we put in. So we bottled that the vintage after the following vintage. Um, spends a lot longer on lees, you know, in in old punchins. No new wood in any of it. And uh, yeah, it's been an interesting, fascinating thing to work with. You know, old Grenache and and make that a certain way. And and you know, that's a tough one to make. I reckon Grenache. You know, just in terms of growing the grapes and trying to pick them at the right time and you know, getting everything. Is it because like the acid just drops and it's susceptible to like. <sighs> I think well, lots and stuff. Well, it's definitely susceptible, but so I think that's okay if you get your viticulture right and you get mm. your, you know, what you're doing. But I think it's picking time. I think the variation across the bunch, you know, they're quite big bunches, and mm. so you're trying to, yeah. You just, oh yeah, you don't know the sampling of it. You don't know the bome of it. It's really hard to. Yeah. And yeah. You, right. So you're walking the vineyard, and the the changes within days. It's probably the most. Like Pinot's another good example of picking times need yeah. to be bang on, but Grenache is is very much like that as well. Yeah. Mm. Was the grower right though? When you think it's arrived, you got to wait two weeks. <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> so the naming conventions. So I've always found Shaw and Smith's naming conventions for its its wine brands. No one's brought it up. No one's brought it up. But there's a thing here. Obviously, when like Martin and Michael met, and they're like, "All right, what should we call this?" And like, "What's your last name? What's your last name?" Shaw and Smith happened. Yeah. And then of course, like. The other wine co is quite literally just, well, what are we going to call this? Well, it's just the other it's wine the other co. One. And then Mad comes along and it's like, how did you decide on the name for Mad? And it's like, isn't it just your first names? That's true. Says, <laughs> we, we are void of creativity. <laughs> the wine, how did to, well, but Toll Puddle already existed, Toll didn't Puddle it? already existed. Yeah, yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, it was a... Uh, 
a, a, a pretty famous kind of uh, uh, vineyard that was selling mm. selling fruit to some pretty you know some of the bigger companies and going into some of their best wines and um, yeah and had a great following and yeah I think when, yeah if you yeah that vineyard kind of it made sense that it kind of was its own place and its own name and it it stayed that way the other ones were a bit yeah I mean Mad was kind of yeah that's <laughs> there's been a few different uh options thrown forward for that but yeah i think it's funny we talk about it a bit that you know once you get the creativity like you you get the idea right sometimes you put a name on it and then like a year later it just it feels like the right name you know Mm. what i mean you sort of live with it it grows on you sean smith you know you wouldn't think just it just makes sense so i think the naming's interesting you guys have got some good names yeah 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 we also change the names a lot too i'll be <laughs> honest we keep changing the names yeah, up talk about being yeah. void of creativity we're very creative what we do is we just take what we're saying about the wine so troppo for example which is oh there's too much of this fruit and then we go how do you say it in another language oh italian we troppo, done. troppo done. done that's it yeah yeah we've got too <laughs> much let's add a p to it yeah, next yeah, yeah. year <laughs> <Use everyone's laughs> well. hey. um uh, the the toll bottle stuff because are you still bringing that across the strait yeah do you hear yeah. this so they pick grapes in tasmania i'm bringing it across the- Man, I think it's bizarre that people do that from Kangaroo Island. How are you doing it from Tasmania? Like, Yeah, well, I mean, we don't have a winery down there. And uh-huh. uh, first year I was down there, we made it uh, at someone else's winery. And uh, I don't know, it's a bit like cooking in someone else's kitchen, you know. Mm. It just doesn't feel right, you know. It's so there is a winery for sale at the moment in yeah, Tassie? Yeah, I did hear that. Good I one, dredgies. That. Yeah. Yep. Get, get a little a little dredgy in you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So a bit of dredgy. in terms of timeline, uh, grapes coming off the vines and then getting on a truck, going to a ferry, like how long does it take to get the grapes? Yeah, it's sort of a couple of nights. So it's, uh, yeah, so what? it's funny. We sort of learned a lot doing it We because it, it's, a you know, you spoke about oysters before, but there's just such a huge produce, you know, kind of bowl in Tasmania mm. that goes up the east coast. And so it's quite easy to tap into the cold chain that exists. There's a bit of logistics of, yeah, already yeah, existing. Yeah, already yeah. existing. Um, so my thoughts were, and if you think about like, yeah, the thinking behind it was, you know, we make this wine in someone else's winery, then at some point we're going to probably want to bring it back, you know. Mm. And so for me, the the thing was, why, why don't we just pick it really carefully, you know, put it in some bins, you know, where we know we're going to want it at a, at a cooler temperature anyway and then cool it on the way to us, which, uh, which we kind of do. And uh, mm. so, it's, so it's picked during the day. It then, you know, goes overnight to Melbourne and then uh, by the following night, so then it comes from Melbourne. So that night, depending on if there's a night shift or whatever at the winery, it might be processed that evening or the following morning. So, mm-hmm. um, and it's amazing. when you We only put 300 kilos in a bin and so... When you put that amount in there, you get no juicing, and so it's yeah, pretty, mm. a pretty cool thing to do, and it works well. And in fact, it's meant that we've gone back to what we do in the hills, and we like we don't fill our bins as high. We're like we need to put, you know, we just and sometimes we'll leave our fruit in the fridge for two nights, you know, rather than one. Because you imagine in the hills, you know, sometimes you have a day might be thirty degrees when mm. you're picking. Mm. That fruit comes in, you know, it's often above 20 degrees it's very hard to drop that down over over a 10 hour period to, to true the, to the temperature you need mm. so speaking of we're coming up on time at the moment but i'm still curious to know about the status of eldersley what's what's going on there yeah still 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 battling away eldersley's my you know uh little side hustle and uh yeah I, look i when i first started I, like I've, I've always sort of had something i've done personally for myself and i just yeah, yeah, as you can probably tell, pretty into wine. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming across. <laughs> yeah, but when you've got when you've got amazing sort of Grenache, Shannon, uh, Tassie fruit, uh, Pinot Shard floor projects, Arinto as well. Like, what is what's what's Eldersley hold for you? Yeah, well, I sort of it was a blank slate, you know, when I started when I first so I started in sixteen with uh, Nicole Roberts and the Roberts family, you know, they, they, those guys were at uni together and we were like, let's make some wine together and, uh, you know, which is always a good idea over mm. a few, you know, bottles of wine. Mate, I've had people <laughs> tell me that. So the fact that you're getting offers of it doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, we should start a little side up. No, dude, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh. Yeah, so at least at least those guys are, yeah, knew what they are doing. Uh, but, um, yeah, so we, we sort of, well, I was thinking, there's a fair bit in the hills that kind of hadn't been kind of considered. And mm. so the idea was to go to, um, you know, uh, someone who we're working with viticulturally and think about varieties that kind of are of interest that probably don't get, you know, the 
the the exposure or kudos or, or something would be interesting to make. And so those two varieties that sprung to mind straight away, one of them was Pinot Blanc, you know, like I mm. think that's something that <clears throat> I always thought is a variety that, you know, sometimes in Burgundy you mm. see it with great mixes. For me, those wines are really textural. There's a savouriness that you don't get in Chardonnay. It's a, it's a fascinating thing that I think could be part of the, the you know, wine landscape going forward. So that was one. And the other one was Gamay, um, you know, so I, and because I think part of the hills, you know, there's these windows where Pinot works in the hills, but it's not yeah. everywhere. And so, you know, there's there's lots of places if you think about, you know, Burgundy to, you know, Beaujolais to the Rhone, there's, you know, there's a fair bit in the bit middle there that kind of works well. And the hills, there's, there's some similarities, you know, you've got the high mm. cooler parts that can grow, you know, you know, Pinot and Chardonnay and then, as you get warmer, there's obviously some some better spots for for Gamay, and then there's some spots where Shiraz obviously works. So, yeah, Gamay was a bit of a no brainer. So that been doing that for you know since sixteen as well. We probably needed to 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 get those vines sorted out, but it took a little longer than I would have hoped. But as many vineyard projects do, and mm. then the last one was a little bit of neb, uh, and that was partly because um, Primavera, who sell sell the wines in in uh, in Melbourne. Um, good friends and uh pj was like i just want to see a nebbiolo out of you mate you know and uh and so the challenge was kind of laid down and there's that there is that weird fascination with people that make pinot i think as well to just go oh, i wouldn't mind having a look at neb and see yeah. how that goes and because it's it's a fascinating variety to work with in terms of you know thinking about tannin management mm. thinking about acidity it's such a weirdly long growing season for that variety mm. so there's there's a fair bit to unpack there um, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's one of the 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 the. I think yeah, we call them penophiles and nebophiliacs. They're like <laughs> Brendan calls them that. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think they're two they're 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 two peas of the same pod, uh, really. Um, but um, mate, it's been fantastic uh, having you on. I didn't even get through half the questions that I wanted to get through. Yeah, I had to take over <laughs> and ask about basic wine making techniques. <laughs> little, uh, so sorry about that, fellas. <laughs> Uh, mate, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, thanks no. for having me. Great to catch up. Mm. No, and obviously if they, people want to support Sean Smith, we'll put all the links in the description below as well as Eldersley as well. Awesome. Mate, thank thanks, you. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Nice. Pleasure, dude. Awesome. <laughs>